I mean, out of the blue, a very good, nice man called Scott Stroman, uh, who composed the score, um, plucked my, my play from oblivion and said, uh, look, this will make a great opera. And I thought he must be pulling my leg, you know. Um, it was just, a, it was a fairly intimate play um, with Richard Wilson in the main part about an awful family weekend where everything goes wrong. Um, and he said, this will make a wonderful opera. And I, I said, well, well, all right, if, if you're that keen, show me. And he has done that. He's uh, consistently sort of stuck with the idea for about um, uh, throughout the COVID time and it's on with we I think we're six professionals all the rest are amateur singers with the Highbury Opera Theatre and it's a huge excitement and it's actually rather better dare I say it than the play. <laughs> so when was the play originally on you said back in the in the 90s a long time ago then? In the 1990s before everything was invented <laughs> um, 1994, it was on in the West End, as I say, with Richard Wilson um, excellently playing the, the central part, the grumpy old man, ah. loosely based on my dear old dad. <laughs> really? So, I mean, no better man. So he was uh, Richard Wilson, what is in his pomp then, as Victor Meldry, of course. So I'm sure that was a, a huge hit when it was on. And so, so tell us about the, the central character, uh, Stephen Frebel. Um, you say based, based Stephen, on your own family well, background. Yeah, it's Stephen Febble, actually. Febble was oh. the Observer misprint, I have to say. <laughs> well, that's uh, what I read, the, the good old Groniad stable. Yes, I know. Uh, yes, of course. No, 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 I'm not blaming you, damn it. For your, um, uh, Febble is, is based, uh, based loosely on my father, but he's, he's really based on all those um, grandparents get to a certain age and get very set in their ways and don't like things to change. And the family come um, far too regularly back to their little house in Suffolk um, for his for his liking. Um, he's a, he just likes to be with his whiskey and his Daily Telegraph and not to be bothered. And the family arrive, and they've got the daughter who's always listening to music all the time um, on on a headset. Um, they bring a dog, which he particularly doesn't like because it crapped on his tie last time it came. And uh, it, it's just generally um, uh, someone who is very, very cantankerous and, and, and wants, wants the world to just um, get away from his doorstep. But mm -hmm. it can't, you know, and, the, um, and his wife loves the family. His wife, and, and in the end, actually, what happens is that his wife and uh, he himself resolve um, their differences after terrible quarrels during the weekend, something good comes out of it. Yeah, and it hasn't been um, unseen or unheard since the 1990s altogether, because there was a Radio 4 production, wasn't there, where you did play the title role? Yes, in fact, I did, and uh, um, uh, Penelope Wilton played my wife. It was a, it was a great cast. Um, and also, actually, it, it's done very, very well on the amateur circuit. Um, lots and lots of little amateur companies up and down the country seem to like doing it, and I get some very, very nice requests to um, send a message to the cast, <laughs> and I say, thank you, thank you for keeping the play alive. But now it's become an opera. I mean, we'll, we'll need the Opera House Covent Garden next. <laughs> now, uh, you know what I'm going to ask you? Having played the role, you know the part, why aren't you in, uh, in the opera? I'm, I'm sure you've got a, a fine baritone. <laughs> well, I don't know. You'd be misinformed, rather <laughs> like the misprint of a pebble. I, I can sing, but I, I mean, my limit is uh, the Lumberjack song, uh, <laughs> which I once sang at the Albert Hall, which was a high point of my singing career. Um, and uh, since then, I've retired my voice to um, more, more or less strenuous activities. But I just couldn't sing like the, the people yeah. who sing this. Um, the guy, the main singer on this is terrific and it's really powerful. And what it's done is, is sort of elevate, elevate the sort of ordinariness of the story and the little one-liners and all that into a glorious sort of epic drama with a chorus of 30 people there all echoing the words about the dog, not the dog, and all that. Um, and it's, it's, it's really, they've really transformed it and done a fantastic job. And talk to me more broadly, Michael, about the return, of course, to the theatres. I mean, after such a long hibernation, it seems, during these dreadful lockdowns, um, people are just um, aching, bursting to, to get out and see things live again, aren't they? Yes, I mean, I think that that's what's happened. There have been 
a sort of year or slightly more of restrictions and there have been promises that theatres are going to open and they don't open. So when they have opened, I think you just realise how much people love seeing live performance. And I think live, unfortunately, being the operative word, it's been a terrible time during COVID. A lot of people um, are um, you know, no longer alive. So just to see this assertion of, of life again and performance again and emotions being enlisted and all that, I think it's done a terrific amount of good to people uh, and to the theatres and the actors as well, from what I've heard. Yeah, yeah. And so, but it's a limited run, this one. As you say, I mean, it's been in amateur yeah. productions up and down the country, but, but people are going to want to see this one. So what is it? It's only on for a few days, isn't it, initially? It, it's literally on for, for um, um, Saturday, Sunday and Monday, four performances. But having heard, you know, the... the the um, amazing sound that these singers produce in their voices. I, I'm, ama I'm amazed they can do it for you know four four shows in three nights. It's it's a very hard very hard work that they put in. Now I've got a question for you. Uh, lastly, about um, we we called you a cultural treasure. I'm not sure you're going to sell yourself for the big bucks to um, to Netflix, but it's also been announced today. Um, you know, and this idea we're talking about live performance and you know the the small that, that ability to almost touch and feel a performance, and then what yeah. a lot of people have been doing during lockdown, which is you know watching box sets on Netflix, and we hear the Netflix have bought up the uh, entire catalogue of Roald Dahl's works. I mean, you know, what are your feelings about that? Well, I think Netflix do a, a, a fairly good job. They, they have uh, quite high standards. And to be honest, I, I've, I've watched a lot of television, a lot more than I normally would during lockdown. And, and a number of those things have been Netflix productions, but also BBC productions, um, Sky productions. Um, whatever. Um, I, I think, you know, you just have to look at the quality. If the quality is maintained, I think that's absolutely fine. Um, but I, I, do, I do take much comfort from the fact the way live performance has been received again. Uh, and, you know, I love theatre and I love being on a stage and I love doing a performance which is going to be different every night. Um, and that, that to me, you know, the, the rapport with the audience for just that time that you're there is what's most important. The rest of the stuff, I think, is becoming a bit like a factory. And a lot, I think a lot of the, 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 the shows and the dramas beginning to look, one, one looks very much like another. But there have been some just wonderful things, Queen's Gambit and things like that, which I think have just been marvellous. So I'm hopeful. And we love seeing you performing. So, Michael Palin, been an honour and a pleasure and a joy and all the rest of it talking to you. Thank you very much indeed. Thanks, Dermot, for inviting me on your show.